and then I will uh, try to mute everyone. And then if you have any questions, just unmute yourself and then uh, interrupt me. Okay, share screen uh, should be this one. Okay, uh, China's, China's uh, peaceful rise. Uh, last time we talked about uh, whether China is rising and will, will it collapse? And then uh, whether the rise itself has been uh, peaceful. Uh, today we'll concentrate on Middle East. So we are looking at the Chinese uh, peace efforts in Middle East. I will only quote the latest example because uh, previous actions are mostly um, secretive among themselves. But eventually, um, we have two significant um, achievements in the past two years. Uh, we know that um, 2003, uh, no, 2002, 2002, um, Russia uh, started a special military operation or invade uh, Ukraine. So the world is actually uh, almost split. The Western countries, uh, the European countries, plus um, US and then Asia here, Japan and South Korea um, applied the maximum sanctions on Russia. So the number of sanctions applied to Russia is in the, re uh, in the range of about 12,000. 12,000 different sanctions on uh, Russia. Uh, for example, uh, even this year, 2024, in the Paris Olympics, uh, Russia and um, Belarus, is that Belarus? Um, was prohibited to participate as a country, whereas um, Israel is officially represented. Among many countries, including China, India, and uh, Africa countries, and most of the Asian countries, etc., has not applied sanctions to Russia. The result is that Europeans stopped buying oil and natural gas from Russia. Russia being, I think it's either the second or third largest oil producer. So uh, that, did that mean that Russia um, oil is not flowing out? The answer is no. Um, one particular case is India. India imported a lot of oil from Russia. It jumped about five times uh, within about 24 months. India also started refining the uh, oil and then selling the oil to Western countries. So effectively, what had happened is that the Russia energy is now rooted through other countries, for example, India, and then eventually end up in uh, Europe. Another case in point is that uh, in 2002, about September, there were several large um, LN LNP, LNG, uh, the natural, liquefied natural gas, LNG. Several large shipments of LNG 
which was signed long time ago, due to deliver to um, China. Instead, China routed the LNG to Europe and make a huge uh, profit. So the question is, what is China's uh, position? Well, basically, China has uh, blamed the enlargement of NATO when Soviet Union uh, collapsed in 1991. There were oral agreements. Unfortunately, the agreement isn't written down, but there are many uh, evidence showing that at that time, uh, U.S. promised not to expand NATO eastward by even one inch. Of course, after that, we know that uh, many former uh, Soviet uh, countries joined the NATO, including Poland, etc. So, um, since uh, two two thousand and fourteen. We have the maiden uh, revolution in Ukraine. And then from that onward, in the Donbass region, the Ukraine government has been um, applying military actions in the Donbass region. The Donbass region is in the eastern uh, Ukraine. The population there are mostly Russian uh, ethnic groups, and they speak uh, Russia, Russian. And that uh, continuous, for example, bombardment of the uh, citizens in the Donbass, uh, Donbass region obviously has uh, annoyed uh, Russia because these are people uh, closely linked with Russia and then they are speaking Russian anyway. I think the seed for the war is planted by uh, 2014. As the Ukraine government progressed in more, adding more violence against its own population, the Donbass regions uh, want to become independent. And obviously, Russia has been helping them. By uh, 2021 December, Russia, uh, through diplomatic channels, convened to United States and NATO that Russia will strongly object Ukraine jointly joining NATO, citing when Ukraine joined NATO, then these missiles, especially coming from the uh, United States, will be very close to Moscow, about a five-minute flight, and that is unacceptable to Russia. So basically, uh, in 2021, there's almost an ultimatum uh, trying to block Ukraine from joining NATO. Obviously, uh, both uh, NATO and United States uh, said that a country has a right to join another organization. Uh, it is its sovereign, sovereign right. So the by fe late February, Russia initiated this special military operation into Ukraine. The military objectives is to uh, stop Ukraine from joining NATO. That's the number one objective. The second objective is to the Nazi uh, Ukraine because um, as we now know, there are a lot of Nazi uh, 
fractions inside Ukraine, especially in the military. But the war has is still fighting up to now, so we don't know the result yet. By um, 2021, about April, a peace deal is almost ready to sign. But the then um, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson went to Ukraine and convinced Zelensky not to achieve the peace deal. So at the moment, there's still no uh, peace uh, deal available. Maybe they are negotiating uh, in the background, which we do not know. So the Chinese position is that they uh, we recognize the history of NATO expansion. And the second hand is that um, he is also stress you uh, Russia to respect Ukraine's territory integrity and sovereignty. So, in other words, um, China has not condemned the Russia invasion and has abstained during United Nations votes on the war in Ukraine. In contrast, we noticed that uh, both NATO and United States have been supplying uh, weapons to Ukraine. Initially, it was the old um, uh, weapon equipments, mostly from the uh, late uh, Soviet era, and then progressively, uh, they sang in the modern tanks. And now F-16 is firing in Ukraine. But the official position is that NATO will not fight for Ukraine. But we know that actually the army in Ukraine were trained by both United States and NATO officers. And in some operations, there are foreigners, meaning they are not Ukraine, killed within Ukraine. Obviously, these foreigners may be military specialists sent from NATO or United States into Ukraine. So in a way, the war between Russia and Ukraine is a proxy war between the old Soviet and the new US empire. So they, the, this is a proxy war. And the Chinese position is we still, we stay neutral. You fight your problem. We are not helping either side. But of course, from the Western point of view, um, China refused to apply sanctions on Russia. And then we, every now and then, heard about uh, some news claiming that some of the products which China sent to Russia can be used militarily. And that is a violation of United States sanctions. The Chinese position say, okay, you sanctions uh, Russia. That's your problem. That's your call, your law. But your whether your law should apply to us is another issue. China refused the long arm uh, law applications of United States. Now that raises a very interesting uh, geopolitical situation. We, we know that there are the so-called Western allies, including Australia is one of them. Uh, we have the 
uh, five eyes. This is a in, uh, international uh, spying operation uh, in between um, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and America. We have the AUKUS, Australian, UK, and United States, uh, meaning to uh, build nuclear submarines for Australia. We have also the Quad Group, the India, Japan, Australia, and United States. All these operations are meant to um, contain China, which we have explained last time. The application of sanctions on Russia, one of them is the banding of uh, Russia's uh, banks from the sweet um, inter-banking uh, transaction notification system. And the United States also frozen the Russia United States uh, dollar nominated assets. The same apply to EU. That means if Russia sell oil in US dollars or in Euro, the payment in US dollars or in Euros will not be available to Russia. So to get around this problem, Russia required all those countries which apply sanctions on it has to pay for the energy or any commodity from Russia in Russia's rubles. Of course, um, ruble is not an internationally uh, traded currency in large quantity. So basically, um, you want to get ruble, you need to sell something to Russia. Otherwise, you can't get it. Of course, the other way around is using a third party, for example, India or China, using India's rupee or using Chinese yuan. Using this to get the Russian ruble and then you pay for the ruble. But since there, there is sanctions, supposedly there will be no uh, trade between um, Russia, European countries, and America. But the data show that the trade didn't stop. The trade still continues only through a different third party. Now we have we have seen a lot of oil tankers um, filled with Russia oil and then parked with another tanker transferring the oil in the open sea from the Russia's tanker into another maybe European or maybe Middle East tanker and then the tanker deliver the oil to Europe. Then about 2023, one of the uh, gas pipeline connecting um, Russia with Germany, the uh, undersea uh, pipeline was blown up. That means um, one of the Russia's assets in international waters was sabotaged by whoever. 
that also means that energy costs in Europe will rise and have risen uh, in 2021. Uh, in the winters, the energy price uh, skyrocketed by about 10 times. Of course, recently the, type, the, the price had come back down, but um, there was a lot of uh, fluctuation in um, fuel, in energy. You will, you will ask me why China can rise so rapidly. One of the factor is that until about a hundred years ago, China is not industrialized. Uh, sorry, let me answer the, the door. Okay, I'm back. Where are we? Um, the industrial base, the industrial base of China, is almost zero. So the rapid rise of China is basically industrialized, and now we know that China is the almost is the world's factory, and that's a key point here. If energy cost becomes too high, Europe will de-industrialize. Europe's main economic engine is Germany. If German's energy is too expensive, then the only way for this um, manufacturing is to move away from Germany or Europe into area where the energy cost is low. So the key point here is we have to look at the energy distribution in the world in the next 10 or five, five or 10 years to really understand whether uh, Europe will go into a decline. If Europe can somehow maintain its energy at a reasonable level, I think um, Europe can remain as a developed country. But if uh, somehow the energy fluctuation is too large, many of the manufacturing leaves Europe, then um, the future of Europe, European countries is really uh, questionable. But anyway, now this is the, the geopolitics. Politi but in, in this case, China uh, remains as a neutral uh, country. The other one is um, China's um, diplomatic uh, efforts to enable Saudi Arabia and Iran to normalize their relationship. So there was a trilateral statement signed in Beijing. So uh, this is from the uh, Chinese embassy in Sweden. We see that Wang Yi, uh, China's uh, foreign minister in the middle. And on two sides, we have the Saudi Arabic representative. And on the other side, we have the Iran uh, representative. 
uh, they are holding a agreement. This agreement is the normalization of relationship between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iraq. After seven years of tensions between these two Gulf uh, countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran resumed diplomatic relations after negotiation in the good offices of Beijing from March 6 to 10. This diplomatic breakthrough by Beijing marked the latest effort to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. The position of Saudi Arabia have changed since its king delegated its power to the uh, high princess, high prince. And I think uh, Saudi Arabia is liberalizing, although it still remain as a Islamic uh, country. Now Iran is obviously a Islamic country, as its name in its a country's name, Islamic Republic of Iran. So it is a Muslim country. On March twenty third, uh, sorry, on March tenth, two thousand and twenty three, Saudi Arabia and Iran announced the normalization of ties, a uh, brokered by Beijing with a joint trilateral statement. Some key points on this statement are the Saudi and uh, Iran start sides express their appreciation and gratitude to the Republic of China, sorry, to the Republic of Iran and the Salatite of Oman for hosting rounds of dialogue that took place between both sides during the years 2021 and 2022. So the effort had been a couple of years in building, in building up. The two sides also expressed their appreciation and gratitude to the leadership and government of the People's Republic of China for hosting and sponsoring the talks and the efforts they place towards its success. The three countries announced that somehow the Iraq and Oman are now our question. So it is a trilateral, meaning it is between Saudi, Iran, and China. And in this trilateral agreement, then the two countries, the Iran and Saudi Arabia, agree to resume diplomatic relationships and we opened the embassies and missions within a period not exceeding two months. There is a time uh, timeline there. And the agreement includes the affirmation of the respect of the sovereignty of states and the non-interference in internal affairs of states. Um, Chinese diplomatic um, policy or doctrine has been one of non-interference. That means China is not going to interfere with other people's domestic policy. The second and other important doctrine in Chinese uh, foreign policy is respect of sovereignty of the states. That means China will refuse to change another country's uh, land size. They respect each other's uh, land boundary as set at the moment. So these two um, Chinese uh, foreign affairs uh, doctrine has been included in this trilateral agreement. They also agreed to implement the security cooperation agreement between them, which was signed on, this is interesting, 1422, first month, uh, 22nd day. So this is a Islamic um, 
calendar uh, corresponding to 2001, April 17. So converting to our normal calendar. And the general agreement for cooperation in the fields of economy, trade, investment, technology, science, culture, sports, and youth. We will just sign, again, there is an uh, Islamic date and then corresponding to 1998, uh, May 27th. In all these uh, agreement to cooperate, there's one obvious thing, obvious things missing. Joint military cooperation or military uh, communication between the two parties. So that means although they are agreed to uh, resume trade, in investment, technology, science, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but they are still skeptical of the other parties. They are now close together in order to improve relationship, but the relationship at the moment is still very tense in a sense. People may ask why China put in some, such an effort. The first pause, the first thing is, as I said before, uh, China maintained a non-interventionist approach in its foreign policy adopting neutrality over the internal matters of other countries. So, so in this regard, is that a violation of Chinese non-interference uh, doctrine? So it was argued that in this regard, the Saudi-Iran deal sets a new precedent in Chinese foreign policy with Beijing taking on the mental of an international mediator. So being a mediator is quite quite different from an interference of other people's domestic affair. A Chinese has always said that um, China will judge every incident by its own merits, incident by incident. China is a non aligned countries similar to India. Uh, China will not form alliance with any other country. Although we may say that the relationship between Russia and China has been very close. Yes, this is a very close friendship, but it doesn't mean that these two countries is obligated to act together in areas where both sides benefit, they obviously would choose the same path. But in case there's conflict, then each side will take its own consideration and draw up its own actions plan. Uh, this is quite different from our alliances. For example, NATO. NATO is an alliance. One of its calls said that if one tree, one country is being attacked, it is considered to be an attack on all the NATO countries. And all the NATO countries will contribute to defend the attack. At the moment, Ukraine is almost like a NATO country, except NATO is not officially sending armies into Ukraine territories to fight for Ukraine. Two key incidents. We also noticed that all this is accumulated by uh, Xi Jinping during his visit to Saudi Arabia. These two uh, more recent uh, instances demonstrate Chinese interest in Middle East. 
So when Xi Jinping visited Saudi Arabia in 2022 December, and then later on Xi Jinping also um, participate in the first China and a and Arabic countries uh, summit. The two sides reaffirm the joint statement that they would firmly support each other's core interest. Uh, support is not participate, it's support. And support each other in safeguarding national security and territory integrity and jointly defend the principle of non-interference in other countries' internal matters. So this uh, always, has always been uh, Chinese um, foreign policy doctrines. On December 9th, Xi in his keynote speech posited that China and the China Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, sorry, I, I, I call the meeting wrong. It is the China and the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council meeting, uh, should be partners for greater solidarity, further consolidate political mutual trust, firmly support each other's core interests. Different countries have different core interests. One of the core interests of China is the reunification with Taiwan. And this is a line for any uh, countries trying to have a diplomatic relationship with uh, China. It must agree the one Chinese policy, one China policy, meaning Taiwan is part of China. Or, or the reverse, converse, China is part of Taiwan. So they are one China no matter how you call it. The current government in mainland China is People's Republic of China. The official government name in Taiwan is Republic of China. The Republic of China is formed in 1911 by Dr. Xi Sen after the downfall of the Xing dynasty. Then we have the Republic of China. And then uh, China basically went into civil war between the two major political parties, the Kuomintang or People's um, National People's uh, Party and the Chinese Communist Party, both sides engage in um, some kind of civil war and with a lot of other warlords uh, taking part in different area of China. And then of course, um, three years before the Second World War, China has this uh, Sino-Japanese war when Japan invaded China. China, sorry, uh, Japan surrendered to United States in its cease of war between China and Japan. Japan agreed to hand back all the occupied territories to China which will include the South China Sea, the Taiwan, Taoyu Island, and the, uh, I can't remember the name anyway, but unfortunately, uh, Taoyu Island, uh, United States, you need that today, uh, allow Jap Japan to, uh, to hold the administrative uh, responsibility. So Taoyu Island is still 
a sticking point between uh, Japan and China. And of course, uh, Taiwan is another issue. So after the Second World War and Civil War at really break out, and then eventually um, PLC, uh, People's Republic of China, drove our OC, uh, Republic of China, away from mainland China. And a lot of people say, well, since ROC have left the major, major landmass of China and not uh, only controlling a very small population of China, we consider ROC already collapsed, finished. That's one way of looking, looking at the history. The other way of looking at history, no, uh, China is now separated into two countries like South Korea and North Korea, two different uh, governments controlling uh, different parts of the country. That's another way of looking at it. But if you want to establish diplomatic relationship with PRC, People's Republic of China, you must agree the one China policy, meaning Taiwan is part of China and China is part of Taiwan. They are inseparable. Although at the moment they are governed differently by different governments. This is quite different from South Korea and North Korea. Although I think the Koreans want to be united and to become one Korean countries, but I don't think it is possible. Constitutionally, on the ROC part, it also says there's only one China. And I am the uh, legitimate government. ROC consider it is a government in exile. It, it now is in Taiwan and trying to we control the mainland China. But as time progresses, we see that the, um, the ability of Taiwan to recapture mainland China is approaching zero. So later on, we might want to look at the relationship between uh, China and Taiwan. But this is the, one of the core interests. The Chinese core interest is unification of China. So the, the, any diplomatic uh, agreements is always is one of the statements. So there are two statements which always included in any diplomatic uh, agreements with China. One is the one China policy. Uh, the statement will say both parties support one China policy. The other statement is that it will support each other's core interests, defend each other's core interests. In February 2003, uh, the is now deceased uh, Iran president visit Beijing. Uh, this is the first stay visit by an Iranian leader in over 20 years. So we see that having been quiet for a long time, China is now more active internationally, especially in Middle East. She extended China's support to Iran, promising to safeguard its sovereignty, independence, international integrity, and national dignity, and oppose external forces from interfering in Iran's internal affairs and undermining its security and stability. 
very similar. Almost every agreement with China we have something like this. The core principles of Saudi-Iran deal is Iran's willingness to actively improve relations with its neighboring countries. China's support to the Middle East in resolving conflicts through dialogue and consultation to achieve peaceful, neighborly relations and China's interest in playing a constructive role in promoting regional stability. All these impact include a strengthening Xi's, uh, Xi Jinping's um, leadership. It promotes a constructive actor role in international affairs, comp especially compared with the military role by the United States. It is part of what CG called Global Security Initiative. Um, the Global Initiative is distinct from what the United States call rule-based global order. The Global Security Initiative is based on UN charters, not rules or whatever. It's the UN charter. So it is trying to put provide an alternate global security order based on uh, this global security uh, challenge. Another way to look at it, of course, is a competition between China and United States. China is paying more and more a role in Middle East, whereas the American role in Middle East seems to be diminishing. This agreement demonstrates China's role as a promoter of security and stability, a partner of development and prosperity, and a promoter of unity, self-improvement. The American expert, Stephen Watt called this deal a wake-up call for America. Uh, it highlights China's attempt to present itself as a force for peace in the world, a mentor that the United States have largely abandoned in recent years. Among all this, we have to look at what is the interest behind it. China and Arabic countries maintain bilateral trade partner and have a trade figure amounting to 330 US dollars, a billion US dollars in 2021. And the, the growth is at around 8% between Arabic countries and China. Now China's current uh, trade is growing at about 7% per year compared with last year. The GDP of China, uh, the trade is now about 30% of Chinese GDP. The Chinese GDP growth this year is about 5%, depending on the later half of this year. Uh, I will think the third, third the fourth, third quarter may be looking at 4.9, 4.8, and the fourth quarter may jump up back to 5.1, making the overall about 5% for 2024. That's my expectation. Can Don't hold me on that. We have to look and see. But in terms of trade, China... The largest trading partner of China is the Asian countries. It was United States at the at about 30 years ago. But now United States now I think is the third largest trading partner rather than the first. 
So there is a lot of trade between China and the Arabic countries. China also has this Belt and Road Initiative. And under this, um, China is offering to do a lot of uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, of course, um, the Gulf states have a lot of energy, a lot of oil in particular. And this is one of the resources um, China wants to maintain. The, this is from, uh, I think, I can't remember where it come from. It is talking about what is the uh, U.S. core interest in Middle East. I think it's two parts. The first part is maintain the relationship, uh, maintain the sell for oil in U.S. dollars. The second important thing is uh, ensure Israel's survival and security. I think these two are Americans' core interests in Middle East. Whereas China's growing power in this region challenge America's long-held political and diplomatic influence in the region. So in terms of advising uh, US, uh, you become more proactive, more economic engagement and so on. Okay, this is from Al Jazeera. Um, not much information. Okay, one year on from, from the signing of deal. Pragmatism is still the main driving force. Both countries has established um, diplomatic relationship and they have been in dialogue. So that is good. The, the war in Gaza is really putting up some strain in Middle East. Saudi Saudis are about to uh, have a formal diplomatic relationship with Israel. But it was um, stopped by what happened uh, last year at October 7th. On the other hand, we know that Iran support is Palestinian Brotherhood. And through, again, different proxies, including the Hutas in Yemen and the uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, these um, military groups draw a lot of support from Iran. And therefore, the tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran for during this uh, Gaza war is really tight. But somehow they maintain mutual um, positions and didn't break out into a public disagreement. Finally, uh, we come to Gaza. This is a very important uh, declaration named after the capital of China. Now, before that, there's only another uh, international uh, agreement named after Beijing. Now, this is the Beijing uh, declaration. It is the ending of division among Gaza uh, Palestinian uh, parties. In 2004, July 23rd, and 
China involving 14 different Palestinian factions signed an agreement and called the agreement Beijing Declaration. All the parties have agreed that they should join the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And that organization is the only legitimate representative of Palestinian. Uh, in terms of the multiple fractions, we have to look at the current situation in Israel. The Palestinians are now basically in two regions. One of the, one of them one one part is in the West Bank. Territory wise, is larger, but in terms of economy and in terms of other things, it is more a um, people living in rural areas in the West Bank, and um, they are mostly uh, secular, and it is uh, ruled by. Uh, Abbas, he take a position of trying to uh, coexist with Israel and opt the position of negotiation. The other region is in Gaza. Gaza is currently ruled by Hamas. Hamas is a um. Initially, it was a welfare group trying to provide uh, social services to people in Gaza. And eventually, it becomes a, a government. And of course, in Gaza, there is a uh, military group. And their position is uh, from the river to the sea. That means... Uh, their position is to drive uh, Israel out of the land of Pal Palestine. So they have a very different position. West Bank is where a PLO is. Now, under this agreement, Hamas will join PLO and will have equal say. So that's the first part. All parties have agreed that they should join the PLO. And that organization is the only legitimate representative of uh, PLS. The idea is having different voices will weaken the voice. So they have to unite together and provide a strong force. There was a very clear feeling that what Israel is doing is really threatening everybody. A new government would ensure the unity of the occupied West Bank and Gaza, ruling both part, uh, territories after the war and effectively uh, blocking Israel's efforts to maintain its occupation of Gaza. So in terms of uh, Positions in Gaza. Gaza people really is now suffering in this Gaza war. The Abbas is going to visit Gaza area, but how can he do that? We don't know because there's there isn't a corridor between West Bank and Gaza. So either Abbas have the agreement of Israel, travel through Israel to Gaza area and meet with Hamas leaders. Or he had to fight outside of West Bank, go to some um, third country, and then from that third country, somehow find his way to go to Gaza. How, how he can do that, we, I don't know yet. But he had expressed um, wish to visit Gaza to see what happened in Gaza 
on the ground. So the plan is to form an interim national re reconciliation government around the governance of Gaza after the war with Israel, as well as of the West Bank. The declaration also stressed the Palestinian people's right to resist the Israel occupation in accordance with international laws and the United Nations Charter and to throw any attempts to display Palestinians from their land. Now, I don't know how somehow this statement can be included. If this meeting was held outside China, for example, in the United States, then you will stress the right of Israel's existence. Here it stress the right of the Palestinian people to resist Israel occupation. It's quite different. So this is the, the background and I'm not going to repeat this again. So um, you can look it up somewhere. At the moment, the Israel war on Gaza has direct debts over 40,000. Direct debts. And in direct debts will be multiples of this number. International experts estimate in any war, the indirect debts is three to 35 times the death toll in the war. <laughs> hmm. So if you take a five times, then it will be 200,000 uh, people indirectly dead due to the war. The population in Gaza is about 2 million. That means it will be about 10%. 10% death. It is a very large casualty to any country. <laughs> okay, now I will stop here and then I welcome questions. So you want to ask me any questions? Unmute yourself and then you can raise a question. Anyone? No? Oh. What are you looking at? My my camera. Come back. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, please, John. And mute yourself, please. You have a mute. Yeah, Albert, I don't remember you referring any to the Chinese invasion of Tibet. Now, it's old history now, but uh, wasn't that an example of uh, China, China starting a war on another country? <coughs> Depending on whether you consider Tibet as part of China at the end of Qing Dynasty, <laughs> Tibet has been considered part of China by the Chinese by the Chinese yes yeah. by um, at least in the Ming Dynasty <coughs> the Qing Dynasty lasted about 200 years and the Ming Dynasty is 250 years. And before Ming Dynasty, we have the Yuan, which is the Mongol Empire. And before Mongol Empire, we have the Tang Dynasty. In Tang Dynasty, on and off, Tibet is already part of China. So Tibet has been part of China on and off, on and off. For example, Tang Dynasty, some period, is part of China, and then when the Mongols come, they break out from China, and then when the um, Ming Dynasty, it becomes a uh, part of China again, and then 
in the late Ming Dynasty, they break out again. And then in the Qing Dynasty, they are being conquered and then becomes China again. So Tibet is a, it's a region where on and off. But to China, Tibet is very important because it is the water source of the three main rivers in China, the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, and the Pearl River. So having a good relationship with uh, Tibet has been Chinese policy for several um, dynasties. The, before the Republic of China, during the Qing Dynasty, it is a vassal state. That means the uh, whoever ruling um, Tibet has its autonomy, but every every now and then they will um, come to Beijing uh, in in the late Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, and before that is come to uh, today's Xi'an uh, to pay tribute to the emperor, and in return the emperor will provide them with uh, gifts. Being in a high, high plateau area, Tibet doesn't have a lot of uh, vegetations. We know that without vitamin C intake, we will suffer from a disease called scalvy. Is that called scalvy? A scalvy. So, uh, Tibet has been dependent on Chinese support of tea. So, by the end of the Second World War, Tibet is a, what's it called? A, a country ruled by religious leaders. And all the rest are just slaves to the to the Tibetan monks. So at that time, the Chinese Liberation Army uh, went into Tibet, drove the um, uh, ruling monks of China, and of course, including the Dalai Lama. So Dalai Lama. Um, get away and then form an exile government uh, in India. But um, since 1950s, something like that, uh, Tibet, or at least Dalai Lama, agrees that he is a Chinese and Tibet is part of China. Although what he's fighting for is returning to his original um, owner-slave relationship with the owners being the, the monks. Of course, the Tibet people doesn't want to do that. And I think uh, after um, uh, this generation of Dalai Lama's death, there will be no, no more Dalai Lama. And that means um, the root, the all ring structure will will disappear. Mm -hmm. So I I won't consider uh, the PLO, the uh, sorry, PLA, the People's Liberation Army entering Tibet as an invasion. It is a liberation rather than an invasion because Tibet has always been part of China. It'd be interesting to apply the same logic to uh, the boundary changes which have occur occurred all over Europe over the last couple of thousand years, uh, from from Romans to different groups controlling bits and boundaries have been uh, highly flexible. But I don't think anybody is there suggesting that you need to roll everything back to some time when an area was under somebody else's uh, control and try and reinstate that, which sounds remarkably like um, the situation between China and uh, Tibet. Well, 
if we want to cite an example, then I will cite the case of Israel. The occupation of today's Israel is based on a 3,000 years old legend saying that God provided this land to his people as his promised land. That is 3,000 years, over 3,000 years ago. Now in terms of the Jewish country or Jewish um, nation, or, or whatever you call it, um, the, their first king is King David. And then after King David, we had a Solomon. And then after Solomon, we had a number of other kings. And then Israel was conquered. And then after Solomon, Israel was split into two. One is called Israel. The other one is called um, Judah. Judah, yes. Split into two, two countries. And then later on, both of them is conquered by the Babylons. And then uh, the Jewish people never form a country again. And then after 2,000, 3,000 years, come back to this land, say, hey, this is my land. So you want to look at uh, boundaries between countries. It is always difficult to, to set down a fixed timeline. Now, for example, uh, the Falkland Islands in North America. Remember, um, is that um, who was the Prime Minister, the, the lady Prime Minister at that time? Margaret Thatcher tried to. Yeah. The um, invited the send an to army go. to protect UK sovereignty of the Balkans Island. So if you look at that, what is the time frame? We are talking about a 300 years time frame. And it, how, how do you consider an area belongs to a country or not? It, it, this, is a, this is a case by case situation. You have to look at the, the history and look at how the people think and how, now for example, at the moment, most people in Tibet we we'll agree they are Chinese. Uh, next term, I will uh, be talking about uh, the size of China. The size of China in terms of, for example, uh, we have recognized 65 minority groups. And these 65 minority groups, some have their own language including Tibet and Xinjiang. They have their own language, but they are part of China as agreed by the people living there at the moment. Okay. Yes, please. Hello there. <clears throat> yes, I was going to question um, your terminology about uh, Donbass. You said... The people are Russian, and the people Russian origin, ethically Russian, and then they speak Russian. Not all of them. Of course, not all of them. Um, so the, we can't say that generally that they are Russian and they want to be Russian. There could have been some people who um, were were agitating, mm. but. Maybe the majority weren't agitating. I think there is one one important thing I want to address later on. Is the the mentality, the, the way of thinking. Now, what I'm trying to present to you is the Chinese way of thinking, and obviously, Chinese way of thinking is different from what we used to in our Western cultures, like here. So if we want to understand China, we need to understand the Chinese mentality. 
And then we also need to understand what happened inside China and how the people in China thinks, whether their mentality is the same as us or they have their own um, different philosophy, different mentality, different way of thinking and living. So same here in, in the case of the Donbass region. When we when I say admit there are Russian speaking, of course it's not hundred percent, but the majority there are Russian speaking. The majority meaning about eighty percent. Of course, there are mixed people there. Now, on the other hand, on the other part of Ukraine, there are also Russian speaking Ukraine as well. Now, before um the Russia. SMO, Special Military Operation. There are uh, TV stations in Ukraine um, only serving the Russian audience, Russian-speaking audience. That means they have TV stations uh, solely in Russian language. That, rep that represents uh, one part of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia. Now, look at the time when Soviet collapsed. What Ukraine have at that time? Ukraine have nuclear warheads, which they voluntarily disassembled. Ukraine is Russia's uh, aircraft carrier builders. Now, one of the aircraft carrier, which because of the collapse, becomes abandoned, didn't complete, was bought by Chinese and becomes the first Chinese uh, aircraft carrier after refitting the shell of that aircraft carrier. Ukraine has the largest aircraft which was destroyed in 2022, January or late 2021 in December. One of the largest um, aircraft in the world. There's only one, which the Soviet used to carry is equivalent of the shuttle. Remember, uh, Russia also have a shuttle program different from United States. And because of that, they need to carry the shuttle from the lawn site to, sorry, from the landing site to the lawn site. So they, they built an aircraft. That aircraft was built in Ukraine. So Ukraine was the heavy industrial centers of Soviet Union. So when, and you listen to the speech by Putin in late 2022, he talked about the common origin of the Russian people and the Ukraine people. And Russia originated from Ukraine and then uh, moved northwards and occupied the current day Russia. So in a way, the origin of the Russian people are Ukrainian. And Mongol and Balkans. Yeah, some of them in the Asia area. In the Western area, in, in Moscow, in that around that region, they were from Ukraine. And then of course, uh, Russia being such a large country, many of them from Mongols, and then also in uh, is that Siberia. I think they're more mixed now though. I think the, you can't really say that um, the, the Viking or the Rus uh, 
all in the, the West and the Mongols are all in the, the East and the Central. I think there's, there's a lot more mixture. Yeah, obviously, yes. But there's another very interesting thing that, um, that lasted thousands of years. The Roman Empire occupied all the land area around Mediterranean at its peak. So it is a huge country, huge empire. The creator of that one is our Han Dynasty. Then after that, after the collapse of Roman, Europe never reunite again. It has been breaking down, uh, different different country fighting each other. Uh, we group, we form, the boundary changes all the time because after the Roman Empire, Europe never we even today when we call European Union, it is not a single government. They have different government, they have different nations grouping together. It is a loose uh, union rather than a tight union. But in China, every dynasty, when the dynasty break down, different warlords everywhere forming like different small uh, kingdoms in Europe. But soon, usually doesn't last over 100 years. Within 100 years, China will we, we unite again, becomes one huge empire in approximately the same area as the area in, in China today. Uh, mostly north, usually just beyond the Yellow River, in uh, the boundary the, uh, at the boundary of the grassland. We know that from Inner Mongolia to Mongolia, it is grassland. And southern part of this grassland is the Tibetan Desert. That the Tibetan, I'm sorry, not Tibetan, is the Gobi Desert. There's a whole desert underneath the grassland. And then we have the China Papa. Like in the China Papa, we know that in the West, we have the Himalaya, the Tibet, and then we have this uh, Sichuan Basin. And then after that, we progressively go to uh, sea level. China's uh, topology is high in the West and sea level in the East. So all the river is flowing from Tibet and then the north is the Yellow River. In the middle is the Yangtze River. And then in the south is the Pearl River. These three rivers has always been China. Plus or minus uh, beyond, uh, a little bit beyond the north uh, Yellow River. How, how, how far? Whether it's include Mongol or just include in uh, Inner Mongol, Mongolia, it it varies between dynasty. But Yellow River on the southern side of Yellow River is always China, and Yangtze River is always in the middle of of the kingdom, and then the southern part again depending on different uh dynasty. Most dynasty will include a little bit south of the uh, Pearl Weaver, the um, Canton is, has always been a port to the outside world. Even in the Ming Dynasty, when the official uh, position is to ban all sea trade, Canton is still a trade, a trade center, and Canton is at the mouth of the Pearl River. So that means uh, in the north, it is almost uh, using the Yellow River as a boundary, and it depend on, depending on different um, dynasty, how, how far from the north of uh, Yellow River is the, is the boundary. It may change a little bit, 
today Inner Mongolia is in, is included in Chinese territory, but not Mongol. In but um since the Yuan Dynasty, since the Mongol Empire, Mon Mongolia has always been part of China. They they co-opted Chinese culture, although they maintain their their language, their their right written words, and their way of life, but they consider themselves as a multi group or as an ethnic groups within China. And then in the south, it can has as far away as the today's uh Vietnam as part of China. And then of course uh, go back again. Vietnam is a very interesting uh countries. It has been on and off of a South State or part of China and then of a South State and then part of China on and off all the time. Wow. So, Does um does the um the government of China have ideas about incorporating Vietnam back into China? At the moment, no. At the moment. At the moment. <laughs> no. Uh, I think there's another interesting different concept here. We recognize conquering a country by force. It's a big effort and it doesn't worth it. The main conclusion is it doesn't worth the effort to conquer a country by force. The better way, the better way is to incorporate them without fighting a war. Or you can call it a cultural uh, colonization. That means you now uh, around China, we have Japanese, we have the Koreans, we have the Vietnam. Until about 150 years ago, all of them used Chinese language as their official language. Of course, Japanese today has still two part two. Two different uh, language systems cooperate together. They have the kanji. Kanji is actually Chinese, Chinese characters. So Chinese characters is part of their language. And get, of course, they simplify it into alphabetic. So are the Koreans. Koreans introduce an alphabetic uh, pronunciation language into their language. And all their official documents, all their archive are in Chinese. Some of the uh, historic historian, historian in in China, including those in Hong Kong, which I, I know them uh, in person, said the best Chinese history record is actually in Korea. A more, according to a more objective historical record. Because Chinese people write their own history. Obviously, it's the Victor who writes the history. So you want to have a more objective. You have to look for history outside of China. And then the best source is from Korea. And they are written in Chinese. And the uh, Chinese scholar in Hong Kong can read that record directly without translation. So when I said uh, China is no, not interested in conquering uh, Vietnam because it doesn't worth it. <laughs> the better way is to have something like a strong trade relationship. Bound, bound the people together by trade rather than by force. I'm I'm concerned about um, this agreement uh, with Russia that NATO wouldn't expand eastward. I'm concerned. Um, I'm concerned how that happened that they did. 
because that's a legitimate complaint then of Russia. I think what Russia has done demonstrates why uh, additional countries want to join NATO, Sweden and Finland, for example. Yeah. Yeah, they... Yeah. Well, um, we're, we're feeling... Russia's right. Join, join NATO. Russia doesn't... That's not post. Oh, you join, you join. But Russia's... A, a, we feel Ukraine to join. But it... Now, when Soviet collapsed, a number of presidents in Russia, the new, newly formed Russia, want to join... EU and want to join NATO, but they refused. NATO refused. Uh, European Union refused. Well, different stage. Now, NATO was set up to counter the Warsaw Pact. And when Soviet Union collapsed, the Warsaw Pact obviously collapsed. Therefore, NATO should have no enemy because the enemy was Warsaw, Warsaw uh, countries under the Warsaw Agreement. But once a organization is formed, it has its tendency to prolong its life. So it had to create a enemy so that it give legitimacy of its existence. The enemy is Russia. And it incorporate the previous Warsaw countries into NATO, including Poland, Estonia, etc. A number of the uh, Eastern European countries, now including Finland or Iceland. Russia doesn't say anything. Oh, you join, you join. Although there was a oral agreement that NATO will not expand east eastward, but the fact is NATO do expand eastward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? NATO is a military alliance. So that means, again, similar case to uh, the... Uh, Asia refocus, where Americans want to move a lot of military power into Pacific. The Pacific countries have to ask why. A major power moving a lot of uh, military equipments into the region which I'm part of. The question is always have to ask why. And then you have to formulate a policy, a response to that. Well, apparently Australia thought it was a good idea. Sorry? Apparently the the government of Australia thought it was a good idea. I think the government of Australia is really stupid. Mm -hmm. Look at Singapore and compare Singapore with Australia. Singapore is in a much better position than Australia. And what oh, does, economically and in terms of human development. What does Singapore think of the AUKUS Pact? Their official uh, officials' uh, position is neutral. None of my business. <laughs> mm. yeah, but, the, the, but, the old problem but, of Taiwan coming up. But Indonesian is objecting the AUKUS. Our Polynesians, all these small small islands along Indonesia, etc., because uh, Australia and these countries have a non nuclear agreement, and now AUKUS is equipping uh, Australia with nuclear submarine, but of course nuclear submarine. And the summary carrying nuclear weapons are two things, two different things. Will our nuclear submarines carry nuclear weapons? I think that is the question. Well, I, I don't care about 
the power source of the of the submarine. The power source of the submarine may be diesel, may, may be battery, whatever. I don't care. What I care is, will our submarine carry nuclear warheads? If yes, I will oppose because we are a nuclear free country. That's our stand. We we pub, Australia publicly um uh filed the 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 agreement in United Nations that nuclear uh, Australia is a nuclear free country. We are not, but unfortunately, in the air base, uh, United States air base in Australia, they plan to position the B-2 bombers here. B-2 bomber is a strategic bomber. What kind of weapons they carry? I really want our government to answer this question. Which um, RAAF base is going to carry those bombers? Which one? No, I mean the bombers in United States military base in Australia. In Darwin? Yes. Or in Iran. What kind of weapons are these strategic bombers carrying? We are a non-nuclear country. If these uh, bombers carry nuclear weapons, then we shouldn't allow it. No, but My surely... Position. Sorry. No, but surely with the advent of AUKUS, um, are we not just sleepwalking into... Um, having a nuclear weapons yes, in I'm, submarines? Yes, yes, I think so. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. How can you have a nuclear sub of the type that they're building now that doesn't have nuclear weapons? It doesn't make it's, sense. They've got to have nuclear weapons, and they will be yeah. in Australia. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. It will that be, be officially owned by Australia, but but managed by Americans. That Agreed. means we are paying for Americans to use a submarine for their own purpose instead of with for our own national interests. Yeah. I use the term sleepwalking, but I don't. I didn't. Re I didn't mean it in that sense. Um, I think we're deliberately walking down this path of having nuclear subs with nuclear arms in in Australian waters. I don't care who owns them. That's where we're going, though. Yeah, I think that's what really happening. And I think we should all be pretty unhappy about that. And At least I'm I'm unhappy about that. And what I'm unhappy about is that Taiwan seems to be happy the way it is, but China is still pushing, pushing, not just not not invading, but very definite that they are going to include Taiwan. Now, well, both sides say the same thing as I have explained. Um, in the constitution of, of Taiwan's government, ROC, China includes the mainland China. That is in their constitution. And in the constitution of People's Republic of China. Taiwan is also part of China. So both sides agree there's only one China. What they don't agree is who is the government. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Taiwanese won't um, give up the, what is the word, the philosophical idea. <laughs> but, but I'm sure that they don't want to become part of mainland China. Uh, I'm not so sure about that because Hong Kong didn't want it. <laughs> um, depending on which media you collect your information from, um, I will argue actually most people who speak Chinese will want to become part of the mainland China. Well, the the ele election didn't show that. Mm. It'd be interesting to have an election in China. Uh, <laughs> yes, there there will be election in China. Uh, it has always been election in China. But 
the the types of electric is different. Now, one thing I want to clarify. Democracy is not election. No. Right? Election, democracy election, is something else. Elections are an essential part of democracy. No. I yes. was I will argue not. Actually, a direct election of politicians at the highest level is the worst uh, government systems ever can be. And if we want to protect our democracy, we must fight against this general election. Let me give, give you one argument, just one. I have... Uh, 31 arguments for that. I have also, I have made video on that, uh, videos on that. I have 20, uh, 31 different arguments against the election. Just one. If you are sick, you want to take a medicine, what do you do? You go out and have a poll and ask people, hey, I'm sick. What kind of medicine you I should take? Or are you going to see the doctor and ask the doctor? A general election is the same as the first approach. The politicians that we have given the votes, we don't know them. We never interact with them. We, we really, really, really don't know them. But in a short period, 30 days, a week, or in America, a year, they come out and then promote themselves. We all know that when you promote yourselves, you only tell people what you good at and never tell you what you bad at. We don't know their, their weakness. We don't know how they think about issues. They may have a block issues, but what about more minor issues? Not on the agenda. How how will they react? We don't know. And then we give them dictatorship power for a couple of years. But well, that... couldn't you say, say the same thing about people who were imposed upon you? Sorry? I mean, could, couldn't you say the same thing about people at the upper echelons who are imposed upon you? No. We, we don't know them either. We don't hear their worst side. Exactly. We don't see and their therefore, worst we side. don't have the right to vote for them. The people but who know them, them has the right to vote for them. And but so, we can't get rid of them. So, the, the Chinese uh, voting system goes like this in the lowest level at your village, you vote for your village chief <laughs> or your village secretary. Okay, so you person know that person. Maybe he is in a village of about 500 people, 1,000 people, votes for a leadership. You may not really know him, but he, you know him in a way you are know, close by. Okay, so that's the lowest level. And where um, the, the threshold of being a candidate and the threshold of a vote is very low. So basically anybody can become a candidate and anybody can vote in that level. If, if oh yes, but the, the candidates have to be members of the Communist Party, don't no. you? No, no. In Hong oh. Kong they do? No, no. In Hong Kong, no. No. Oh. Hong so, Kong's so, Communist so, Party do not have a member in the Legislative Council. <laughs> yes, Hong Kong has a Communist Party, but the Communist Party of Hong Kong isn't, has no uh, legislator in Hong Kong's Legislative Council. Zero. Is, yeah. is there a member of the Hong Kong legislature who is not a Communist Party member? No. That's what I thought. No. Wrong. <laughs> well, people Hong Kong who... do have a number of polit political parties, right? And these parties are independent parties. They are not 
part of the Chinese Communist Party. No, zero. No, no relationship. I thought it to prove candidates could stand. No. Yeah. Only candidates. If I go back to Hong Kong, I can I could stand. If I can secure sufficient number of what's called uh nomi uh nominator. Is that called nominator? Yeah. People who yeah. If I can su secure sub a sufficient now nah, the number of nominators as in Hong Kong, you want to be the uh, Hong Kong ex chief executive. You will have to secure over half of the uh, committees who form the nomination committee. The nomination committee is formed by different groups in Hong Kong. Um, for example, there are professional groups. So there will be uh, daughters, there will be nurse. Uh, each of them have representative in this nomination co committee. The nomination committee consists of 3,000 people. So you have to secure half of these nominee, nominators per uh, person in that nominee councils, half of them. So basically after you securing half, uh, because each of these a member can only cast one vote. <laughs> That's the question. That means once you secure the, the number of nom nominees, you are almost the only candidate. It's very rare you have a exact 50 50 split where you had two. You have only one. And then the Hong Kong people basically votes for endorsement, whether we agree. Now, let me go back to, to the Chinese voting system. The lowest level, everybody can vote. And you vote for people you know in this local area. Factory, factories or village. And then these people obviously work with the larger community. For example, in the province level or different levels. And this province work together and that they can elect people to go into the province um, uh, committee. So again, they are voting for somebody they are working with, they know, and then they elect those into the next level up. And the next level up will work with similar levels, committees from around China, different parts. And then again, they will vote for the next level up and then next level up. Uh, there are about five levels. Mm. So from the lowest level into the uh, People's Congress in the top level, there are five levels. So if you can progress from one level to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, it will take you 25 years. But Albert, as, it, I understand, Albert, as I understand it, it's only, the, it's only the people in those levels who are voting. It's yeah. not the general population, is it? No. So when you actually move up and up and up those five levels, I think you're right with the five, um, less and less people in the general population, you, you would have less and yes, less interaction correct. with the general population. Yes, so correct. They don't know you. They no, don't know uh, you. So what's the difference between them and the democratic election? The huge well, difference, difference is that, first of all, those being, are being moving up are the people recognized in the last level as having the ability. Therefore, well, you move up to the next level. Okay, Oops. but if you translate that back to Australia, a lot of our political appointees, or whatever we want to call them, start at your local council. Hopefully, yes, I mean, but unfortunately it's not. Liberal, if you look at the Liberal Party in New South Wales at the moment, which is a bit of a dog's breakfast, um, the reason they're miffed about not getting uh, nominated is because they're heading towards um, party politics. They they want to join the council to move up into the in the party towards nomination for a seat. So it's the same thing, isn't it? Yes and no. The 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 yes part is yes similar. The no part is you are not fighting different parties. You are. What's in one party, different fractions. 
Now, there's a huge difference between different parties and different fractions within a party. Now, if a party have a party policy, no matter which fraction, you should be you should have agreed with that policy. Otherwise, the policy will, will not have adopted to become the party's policy. All right. So, in a sense, no matter how fierce the infighting are, they have a core common interest protect the party's policy. Whereas for us in a multi-party system, what we see in our politics is that the the, the op opposition always tear down whatever pro pro promoted by the by the ruling party. They are, in a way, one party is trying to build something. The other party is trying to destroy that building. Okay, if the, if the building survives, then after an election, they will say, no, this building shouldn't be used this way. We change it. For example, MBN, our famous broadband network. When it was first proposed, it was optical fiber into each house. Then labor lost. And the one who know network say, no, oh, we can use copper wire. Open Fraser. Uh, in, in China, I can have 5G at around 36 renminbi per month with unlim unlimited band, uh, downloads at 1G, 1 gigabits per second nominal. And on peak, we are talking about 5 gigabits per second in China. Here, my uh, mobile plan is 10 Australian dollars. About That means about the same money in, in, but I have only two, two gig downloads at around 100 megabits. It's 10 times the speed difference. And one is unlimited amount of downloads, and we have a limit of two two gigs. Huge difference. But the the other bit, the other huge difference is that uh, uh, we have access to the uh, World Wide Web without having a firewall between us and it. And so I think a lot of people in China would probably love the uh, access we have to uh, worldwide information. <laughs> our, our information uh, yeah. Are well. Uh, this is a question oh, I want to address next term. I have to leave you with that, Albert. Yes, so, I have to go. Yeah, Thank you, yeah, Albert. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we are over time a little bit. <laughs> okay, okay, we will talk about um, the Chinese peace effort in uh, Asia next week. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay.